Hey boot campers, welcome back. This is David, your guide to gastroenterology, and today we're going to be doing the final video of our pancreatic and biliary chapter, jaundice. So jaundice, as we know, is the yellowing of the skin and sclera due to bilirubin deposition. There is a video on bilirubin in the GI physiology chapter that I definitely recommend you check out prior to this video if you haven't already seen it. I know we've already talked a lot about jaundice during the course of this chapter, but just as a brief reminder, let's go over how exactly bilirubin is processed in the body. So we have our old red blood cells that are then broken down into heme, iron, and globin, and that heme is going to be what makes our unconjugated bilirubin, which is then bound to albumin, sent through the blood, and then into the liver. Once it's inside of the liver, our unconjugated bilirubin is then going to be conjugated. Now this is super important because this should clue us into the fact that when we have liver diseases that are causing jaundice, these are going to result in unconjugated jaundice because our liver isn't properly working and therefore this process of conjugating bilirubin no longer works. Now once that bilirubin has been conjugated, it is then excreted into our intestines via our biliary tree, which should clue you into the next part that anything post-hepatic, so after the liver, is going to be a blockage of this conjugated bilirubin being able to enter into our intestines. And when that happens, we're going to have a rise in conjugated bilirubin as it backs up into the liver. So our conjugation high jaundices are largely going to come from obstruction, while our forms of jaundice that are either mixed or unconjugated heavy are mostly not going to come from an obstruction of the biliary tree. So our main forms of obstruction that we're going to see with our conjugated jaundice are going to be gallstones, cancers such as pancreatic adenocarcinoma, cholangiocarcinoma, anything that obstructs that biliary tree, and also our liver fluke clinorchis sinensis. We touch on that more in our hepatic chapter, but basically that liver fluke likes to go and hide up inside of our biliary tree and thus get in the way of our bile. Primary sclerosing cholangitis and primary biliary cholangitis are also things that obstruct our biliary tree and are thus going to cause a predominant rise in our conjugated bilirubin, thus causing conjugated jaundice. Now the next form of jaundice that I have listed here is unconjugated jaundice. However, I do want to point out that two of our most common forms of jaundice, namely alcoholic jaundice and jaundice from viral hepatitis, are both going to be mixed jaundices meaning that we have an increase in both our unconjugated bilirubin as well as our conjugated bilirubin, and those are going to be roughly the same, typically with a ratio of anywhere between 20 to 50% conjugated bilirubin to unconjugated bilirubin, especially for viral hepatitis. So two of our most common forms of jaundices are mixed jaundices, and definitely keep that in mind. These are both processes that happen inside of our liver. They're not only going to impair our UDP glucuronosyl transferase activity, but they're also going to impair the ability of our liver to properly get rid of bile. Remember, these are conditions that are gonna cause a lot of fibrosis, a lot of local damage to our intrahepatic bile ducts, and thus we're going to have a rise in both forms of bilirubin. So what about our predominantly unconjugated forms of jaundice? Well, those are largely going to be due to either hemolysis or some form of enzyme deficiency. And we'll get to enzyme deficiency in a second, but I want to give you a very popular vignette first for our hemolysis. Let's say we have a young Greek man who has just recently got on board a plane, or perhaps he's gotten on board a plane and just prior to getting on board a plane, he ate a lovely fava bean salad you might immediately be thinking of G6PD deficiency, someone of Mediterranean descent eating fava beans and taking a variety of different drugs should immediately clue you into thinking about G6PD deficiency. G6PD is an enzyme that is absolutely vital for the replenishment of NADP to NADPH. And without NADPH, we are unable to protect our red blood cells from free radical damage caused by reactive oxygen species, and as such, the red blood cells of someone with G6PD will hemolyze, thus causing an increase in heme and an increase in unconjugated bilirubin far more than our liver can handle, thus causing unconjugated jaundice. That is a classic vignette 
that you will almost certainly see on either step one or a step one practice question, and is a great example to think of if you need to remember the pathophysiology of unconjugated jaundice. And then as I mentioned, our mixed jaundices are predominantly going to be hepatitis and cirrhosis. So definitely think about alcoholic hepatitis and viral hepatitis for those. Now some other forms of jaundice that I wanna cover here because we haven't talked about them as much in our other biliary videos are going to be pediatric jaundice as well as hereditary hyperbilirubinemias. Now the most predominant form of pediatric jaundice that you're going to see is going to be physiologic or neonatal jaundice. And this is simply just because babies have an immature UDP glucuronosyl transferase. This is totally normal. Babies livers take a while to kick into full gear. And what this is going to result in predominantly is going to be jaundice. Now the worry here is going to be kernicterus, which is essentially jaundice of the brain, specifically the basal ganglia. But kernicterus isn't gonna be as much of a concern with this form of jaundice because this is very mild and will typically resolve within weeks of birth and can also be aided by non-UV phototherapy, which is going to increase our excretion of bilirubin by increasing its water solubility and polarity. A more serious form of pediatric jaundice is biliary atresia. Biliary atresia is the fibrosis and destruction of our extrahepatic bile ducts. So that's our biliary tree we're talking about there outside of our liver. And with destruction of our biliary tree, we're going to develop cholestasis. That's going to result in worsening jaundice as opposed to neonatal jaundice, which will improve. And this worsening jaundice is gonna come along with our classic symptoms of dark urine due to increased bilirubin inside of our blood, thus being filtered by our kidneys, increasing our bilirubin concentration inside of our urine, as well as pale stools because our biliary tree does not exist to excrete bile into the intestines, and then also hepatomegaly for this one. Now this is going to result in liver damage, which will not only increase our amount of direct bilirubin, but also our gamma glutamyl transferase. So if you see a neonate with worsening jaundice and you see an increase in gamma glutamyl transferase, as well as hepatomegaly, you should definitely be thinking about biliary atresia. And unfortunately, the liver damage from biliary atresia will likely require a liver transplant. Now getting into our hereditary hyperbilirubinemias, these are an interesting set of conditions. The reason for that is some of them are extremely mild, while others of them are potentially life-threatening. All of these conditions are going to be autosomal recessive. So if you're asked to compare genetics of these on a test, definitely keep that in mind. We're going to start off with our most common and one of the mild conditions, which is Gilbert syndrome. Gilbert syndrome is a mild jaundice that is going to appear with stress, fasting, and illness. And what's going on in Gilbert syndrome is you have a decreased activity of UDP glucuronosyl transferase, that enzyme that we've mentioned over and over again, which actually conjugates our bilirubin. Now that decreased UDP glucuronosyl transferase is not only going to impair bilirubin conjugation, but also bilirubin uptake, which is going to result overall in an increase in our unconjugated bilirubin which is what I mentioned up here earlier with our discussion of enzyme deficiency being a cause for our unconjugated jaundice. Now this unconjugated bilirubin increase is definitely gonna be something you wanna look for if somebody presents with jaundice after, for example, a major surgery, or if they're NPO before a surgery and they are fasting. Gilbert syndrome is very testable because it can pop up during states of illness and thus is an excellent way for examiners to completely throw you off the loop by introducing jaundice into a condition that normally wouldn't have jaundice. And again, what you're gonna see is unconjugated bilirubin. That increase in unconjugated bilirubin will make that stand out from a lot of other conditions, especially our obstructive ones right here that are going to predominantly result in an increase in conjugated bilirubin. The vignette of a patient who comes into the hospital and experiences major surgery and develops jaundice despite never having had it before is going to be a classic vignette that is definitely high yield and something you should keep in mind headed into test day. Now let's look at the other form of our UDP glucuronosyl transferase deficiency, which is going to be Kriegler-Najjar syndrome. So this is a full on absence of our UDP glucuronosyl transferase, absence or potentially just extremely reduced typically absent in the form of Kriegler-Najjar syndrome type 1 and severely reduced in the form of Kriegler-Najjar syndrome type 2. 
in kriegelin najar syndrome, you're going to have severe jaundice, as well as, as we mentioned earlier, kernicterus, which is a deposition of our bilirubin inside of our basal ganglia. And kernicterus is absolutely not something you want to mess around with. And if kernicterus is not treated appropriately, it can lead to a variety of things, including an increased risk for cerebral palsy, learning disabilities, hearing loss, poor teeth growth, things like that. And when a newborn presents with this, you're going to see a lot of symptoms that should make you worried, including poor feeding, irritability, lethargy, hypotonia, as well as a lack of a startle reflex. All of this should clue you into the fact that you're dealing with kernicterus, and thus you want to start thinking about the treatment. The treatment for kriglin nizar syndrome is going to be plasmapheresis in order to start to remove that bilirubin, as well as phototherapy, which as I mentioned is going to increase our polarity and our water solubility, and thus lead to an increased rate of excretion of our bilirubin. However, the only way to truly cure kriglin nizar syndrome is going to be a liver transplant. Now with that being said, kriglin nizar syndrome type 2 does still have some udp glucuronosyl transferase activity, and it is responsive to phenobarbital because phenobarbital is going to increase synthesis of our liver enzymes in general, and thus we're going to have an increased amount of udp glucuronosyl transferase being produced. However, again, in kriglin nizar type 1, it's not going to be responsive to phenobarbital because we don't have any udp glucuronosyl transferase. Now I know that was all pretty intense, so let's end the chapter on a lighter note by talking about Dubin-Johnson syndrome and Rotor syndrome. So Dubin-Johnson syndrome is an impairment of liver excretion of conjugated bilirubin. So this is not an issue with our UDP glucuronosyl transferase because now we are making our conjugated bilirubin as we should, we just can't send it out of the liver and thus we're going to have an increase in conjugated bilirubin. Now this is a very benign condition that is really just notable for a black liver. And this black liver isn't even because of our increased amount of conjugated bilirubin hanging out inside the liver. That would be pretty bad for our liver. This is actually due to accumulated epinephrine metabolites. And these accumulated epinephrine metabolites are going to cause our liver to turn black. And this black liver is really not anything worth noting unless you have a vignette in which a patient comes in for surgery and they find that the patient's liver is black, in which case you should immediately start thinking about Dubin-Johnson syndrome. And then finally, even milder than Dubin-Johnson syndrome is going to be Rotor syndrome. This is also a syndrome of impaired hepatic uptake and excretion of conjugated bilirubin, and in this case, it's going to be Dubin-Johnson syndrome, but without a black liver, which means that of all of these hereditary hyperbilirubinemias, Rotor syndrome is the most mild. That's been it for this video. I hope you all enjoyed it, and I'll see you in our next chapter.